Father, we thank you, O God, for this honor and privilege, O God, of assembling together again to study your word. We ask as we expose your word and study your word on this evening that you would again by your spirit reveal the deep things of God to our spirits. Father, let your word penetrate beyond our intellect, O God, going down beyond the bone and the marrow, God, into the soul and the spirit, O God. Yea, God, let that two-edged sword cut out those things which do not belong, O God, and and plant those things which do, O oh God. Uh, Father, we thank you for everyone here, O oh God. We thank you for everyone that is listening online, O oh God. We thank you for those that will watch later, O oh God. In every case, we pray that your word does the work in the hearts of all of its hearers. Father, we thank you. We ask these mighty blessings. In the matchless and mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 It's Mark what? Mark chapter 10, verses 32 to 45. Mark 10, verses 32 to 45. And of course, good evening, everyone, and good evening, everyone online. It is good uh, to be together again to study the Word of God. Sorry, I had a system issue there for a second. But Mark chapter 10, verse 32, Mark 10, 32, going down to the 45th verse. I will be uh, reading in your hearing from the uh, New American Standard Bible. It says... Uh, they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking on ahead of them. And they were amazed, and those who followed were fearful. And again he took the twelve aside and began to tell them what was going to happen to him, saying, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and to the scribes. And they will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit on him and scourge him and kill him. And three days later, he will rise again. James and John, the two sons of Zebedee, came up to Jesus saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Grant that we may sit, one on your right and one on your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? Or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? They said to him, We are able. <laughs> and Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you shall drink, and you shall be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized. But to sit on my right or on my left, this is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. Mm. Hearing this, the ten began to feel indignant with James and John. Calling them to himself, Jesus said to them, You know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. But it is not this way among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Amen. The word of the Lord is already blessed. May you be blessed by the hearing and reading of God's word on today. Uh, I have as a topic for discussion on this evening, uh, I came to serve and not be served. I came to serve and not be served. The main idea that I want to bring out is that Jesus reiterates that that greatness in the kingdom comes only through service and sacrifice as his life and pending death will demonstrate. Again, Jesus reiterates that greatness in the kingdom comes only through service and sacrifice as his life and pending death will uh, demonstrate. <clears throat> A question for us to just to ponder as we begin our dive into the text is why do we follow Christ? You know, something for your consideration. Why do we follow Christ? What that is what is the motivation of our hearts? So uh what are we seeking? What what drives us in our service of the Lord? Uh, that's important because that's going to govern what we will do, what we will, what we won't do, 
who will we will affiliate or associate with, who will we talk to and not talk to, who we will share the gospel with, and how. You know, it, uh, what what is the disposition of our hearts? I would, I, I will say from the beginning that the text is sort of making clear that the disposition of our hearts is to be one of service. One of not seeking our own glory, but of the glory of God, uh, the Father. Uh, jumping into our text, you know, we've uh, we've got Jesus is almost at Jerusalem. He he's on his way there. You know, there. You know, whenever you they would talk about Jerusalem, it's always going up to Jerusalem. You know, not just because it's well, it is primarily because of its you know it, its high location above uh, sea level, but there was also, you know, you're, you're going up to the holy city. You're going up to uh, the place where the, the Lord uh, would dwell. You're, you're never going down uh, to that. Uh, and so Jesus and the disciples and a crowd, we know, uh, because we're told, is heading towards uh, Jerusalem. And, you know, it, it Mark tells us that Jesus is walking ahead of them. You know, that... He's not walking alongside of them, which is what a rabbi or a teacher would do, walking alongside, teaching and instructing as he is going ahead. He, As he's going with them, he's walking ahead of them. Uh, that location is uh, significant. Um, uh, let me step back a quick, uh, a brief moment. Jesus, this is Jesus' third and final passion prediction. That is to say... Uh, this is the last time he's actually going to describe beforehand what is uh, going on or what's going to happen to him once he reaches Jerusalem. It's also the most detailed description of what uh, is going to happen here because he's talked about being betrayed and handed over before and he's talked about uh, being killed and rising on the third day before. But but here he adds the detail that he's going to be given over to the Gentiles and who are going to mock him, spit on him, scourge him uh, before they crucify him. And, you know, that is significant because, you know, to given the sort of low view, if you will, uh, of Gentiles at this time, uh, you know, to hand somebody willingly over to the Gentiles meant that you had really had a low regard for them. And it, it's going to testify to just how much, you know, Christ was hated. He was despised. He was, uh, you know, they, they, they want not, nothing to do with this individual calling himself the son of man. The events that are described here would occur within one week of him entering uh, the city. And again, re returning to the, to the passage, you know, Jesus is walking on ahead of them and they're amazed. And it says, and those who followed were fearful. First question we have to ask then is, okay, who are is it? Who is it that are amazed, and who is it that is fearful, and and why? What? Why is it the case that they are amazed and fearful, respectively? Well, it seems as if that the ones that are amazed are the disciples, and this shouldn't be a a total surprise to us, given what. Jesus has said previously, you know, if you if you consider the pre, prior two passion predictions and you know what what, what Christ has said in, in this regard, you know, it, it is truly uh fascinating that he would just be marching out as sort of the leader of the pack, you know, uh walking uh with sort of determination, you know, when in fact he's gonna be walking to basically his his suffering, his rejection and his death. So the disciples are amazed uh, that that's going on. And uh, they're marveling that he would so fearlessly be going, given what he has said. Uh, but Christ Jesus did not fear the future uh, that was ahead of him. And in fact, as we just sort of read at the end of the passage, this is why he was here. He was coming to give his life for a ransom and that was his mission and now he is at the point or he's he's just at the point because he's outside the city still but he's at the point where his purpose is about to be fulfilled uh those who are fearful are the other followers remember we, we know that jesus had more than just the 12 uh, uh so there are others who are following and, and and as we'll see next week including that's going to include the man he heals 
Bartimaeus. Um, there are also likely those who are just traveling to Jerusalem, you know, for the uh, for the time of the Passover. Uh, but why are they afraid? What, what is it that they have to be fearful about uh, with Jesus walking towards Jerusalem? Well, it, it, it's possible that they might have heard from the disciples, because that's the only place they would have been able to hear it from, uh, that something negative is going to happen to Christ when he enters Jerusalem. And that perhaps they are wondering if they're going to suffer the same fate. Uh, you know, if, if they come down hard on Jesus, they'll come down hard on the followers of Jesus. Is uh, seems to be the issue here. But right before he gets to the city, uh, or, or while he's still traveling, rather, he again takes the 12 disciples aside. Uh, because he needs to beat the point home. He needs to drive it home that there can't be any confusion. You know, he he is setting a realistic expectation uh, for his disciples. And I would say the, the rest of the scripture, the rest of the New Testament sets realistic expectations for us uh, so that we know, you know, what we are going to be getting into when we embark on the Christian journey. Uh, but he, he, he takes them aside. Uh, he takes them away from the crowd and he says, listen, I'm going to be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes and they're going to condemn uh, me uh, to death. This, again, this wouldn't happen immediately, uh, but, but it's going to happen. He's going to be betrayed. That's not listed here, but he's going to be betrayed by Judas uh, to the religious establishment. Uh, they're going to condemn him to death in an un, uh, unlawful trial in the Sanhedrin. Uh, they're going to, because the Romans took upon themselves the sole prerogative to carry out death sentences, uh, he's going to be given over uh, to them. Uh, you know, the, the Jewish priests and the leaders, and then the Romans are going to spit on him and strike him. They, they do that in the Sanhedrin, and then, of course, the Roman soldiers strike him. You know, before they take him and scourge him, they, they severely beat him uh, and, and mock him and carry out his crucifixion. Uh, our Lord is telling the disciples this in advance so that they may be prepared so that they're, they're not shocked at what uh, they're going to see. Yet, of course, this is not the end of the story because it says, in, and they'll scourge him and kill him in verse 34, and three days later he will rise again. The good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ includes the fact that after three days in the grave, he got up. He would get up and uh, he would have all power in his hand. Uh, by the way, it, it, it's fascinating to note that, you know, Christ is telling them this and he's speaking with such authority. He's speaking uh, with such clarity, uh, such force about what's happening in the future. And at no point in time does Mark ever tell us that, you know, Christ heard a thus saith the Lord. And he was, he was delivering a message from God to Father. No, this was coming directly from his own lips. Uh, I, I bring out that to y'all just to, to highlight something about, again, the nature of Jesus. You know, that, that was the, uh, a large part of what the first part of, part of Mark was about. Who is Jesus? But uh, the second part is really... Uh, focuses on the this issue of discipleship, but even in here, uh, we see a clear indication that this Jesus wasn't just another prophet of God; that he was something greater. And of course, we we know what that greater was. He was God Himself come in the flesh. Amen. <clears throat> but I have to say, if you're looking for an incredible example of utterly missing the point. <laughs> Of just not getting it. You can look. You don't have to look any further. Than these next couple of verses. With James and John. The sons of Zebedee. Or as it's they're referred to in other gospels. The sons of thunder. Um, they pull Jesus aside. You know away from Peter. And away from the other disciples. And they say to Jesus, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Mm. you know, now, that's a pretty bold statement. You know, we're going to ask you something when we just want you to do it. You know, before they ask the question, uh, before Jesus knows what it is, Lord, give us this assurance that you're going to do what we ask. And mm -hmm. our Lord 
for their sakes uh, is not having it. You know, he'll, he asked them, what do you want me to do for you? Uh, and they say to him, grant that we may sit one on your right hand and one on your left in your glory. Now, Jesus is just, you know, at, at some point, maybe there's a span of a few minutes, maybe there's an hour between the journey, you know, we, we, we don't know. But, you know, he, ha he, he pulls them aside for this instruction and at some point, they, they, they separate him from the other ten disciples and they pull him aside and say, Grant that we may sit at your right hand. Grant that we may have positions of authority and power. Mm. You, know, you know, give us the prestige. You know, but you, you don't really have to worry about the other disciples. It, it, it's okay. <laughs> uh, we can handle it. Mm. And... It, that's why I say it's an exercise in utterly missing the point. It, it's it's like Christ, the words of Christ, you know, started here, and instead of going here, went here. He he, he might as well have just not said anything. Uh, and, and and sadly, this is a pattern, right? We the first time he made the passing prediction. Peter pulled him aside and rebuked him. We saw this at the end of Mark chapter 8. No, Lord, you're not going to die. And we talked about that. You know, Christ rebukes Peter and says, get thee behind me, Satan. You know, you, you know you, you're not focused on the things of God. And then in, uh, in Mark 9, when we were looking at the uh, little children, uh, where, you know, they, they, they want to, you know, forbid the, the, the children to come. Well, what are you all doing? And he says, no, 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 listen, don't. Don't forbid them from coming. In fact, you need to be uh, like one of these uh, children. You need to have uh, that uh, mindset. Uh, um, and, you know, just, just before that, you know, Lord, we there was somebody casting out demons in your name, but we stopped him because he's not like, he wasn't part of us. You know, there's this, there's this tendency that was there even in the disciples walking the earth. Uh, to wanna, you know, to wanna be the it people, to wanna be lifted up, to want to have the the pedestals, and it is still the human tendency today. What was the temptation in the garden? You know, two of them they had, you know, uh, that that it was good to eat and uh, it was uh, pleasing to the eye. That they already had that, but what was that third one? It was desirous to make one wise. That's what the I can be like God. I, I can have, I don't have to rely on him. I can rely on me. You know, and this is that perpetual human uh, tendency to want to be lifted up. Uh, even at the expense of others. Uh, now such a request would seem foolish in light of what Jesus just said about his faith. So then we must conclude that with the rest of the disciples, they still didn't understand and in fact, the second time he made the prediction, Mark told us, and that was specifically Mark 9, 32, where it said, but they did not understand this statement and they were afraid to ask him. You know, they, I, you know, we, we might be able to argue at this point that they didn't want to know what Jesus was truly uh, getting at. But despite the prior rebuke and teaching about the greatness of the kingdom, they were still angling for power and influence. You know, they could be, you know, they could be politicians today. <laughs> I, I mean, because that's what they, that's what they do. You know, that once you get, uh, actually get elected, you have to start trying to doing things that, uh, to stay in, stay in power. Even if that means going back on campaign promises, even if it, it means sort of, you know, try and redefine words so that you could try and be faithful, you know, whatever, whatever it is you need uh, to do. Uh, because the positions, uh, as one background commentator put it, the positions on either side of a king's throne, especially the right side, were the most prestigious in the kingdom. Suffice it to say, so that's one problem. But there's another problem here too, and that is that their view of Jesus' messiahship, what it meant for Jesus to be Messiah, was still was still tainted by the expectations of their time. They still had it in their mind what the world was expecting 
as opposed to what Christ himself had said, this is why I came, or this is why I come. Uh, you know, it, it highlights the importance of actually understanding who God is and his purpose, his plan, based on what his word actually says, and not what we want it to say, or not what we think it should say, or or that which, you know, although only those parts that we could seem to use to our advantage. Clearly, they must not accept this reality of his suffering and death. They, they might think that something bad is going to happen, but ultimately, you know, it's going to be okay because he's going to establish his messianic kingdom. Uh, and I, and I've, I've, I've brought this up a couple of times. We have to remember, even after Christ's resurrection, right before his ascension, they asked him, will you now restore the kingdom of Israel? So, you know, it, it, you know that's still going to be in their minds, you know, it, until... Uh, Pentecost, until the coming of the Spirit, until the, you know, their, their eyes, you know, they, they have the understanding and they now, oh, now we get it. In response, Jesus asked them if they're able to partake of the cup he will partake and the baptism he will receive. Now, you could say, if you wanted to, you could argue that this is you know that their 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 response is one of faith. They they believe that Jesus is going to succeed at whatever he's going to do, uh, and and so they say, "We are able, Lord." Uh, I would submit to you that they're still ruled by their misconceptions. They they say, "Yep, we we can do it. We we got this." Um, but rather than rebuking them at this point, it's interesting, Christ uh, or repudiating them, he tells them. Hey guys, in fact, you are going to partake of the cup that I'm going to partake. You're going to be baptized with the baptism that I'm going to be baptized with, though not in the same way. Yo, I I bet they still didn't get it at that time. I mean, they, they would get it later. Uh, but Jesus said, you guys want to go down the road that I'm going on? Okay. You will. I don't think you all understand what that entails. But I'm here to tell y'all, you will uh, have a taste of my cup and of my baptism. And I, as I'll highlight later, in a way, all believers in Jesus Christ will have the same thing. But one thing that Christ can't do, however, is grant that they would sit on the right hand or on the left because that is the prerogative of the Father. Oh. Uh, now, of course, you know, when the other ten disciples hear this, or, or, or they hear about what's happened, we, we don't know how, maybe maybe one was close enough, or maybe, you know, one, they, they come up to Jesus, you know, as he's responded to James and John, and they figure out what's going on. They're indignant. They're furious. How dare you all? You all did this, and you all left us out of it. You all were trying to angle for this and that. In reality, I, I could imagine that some of them were thinking, you, you, you guys, how dare you do that? You beat me to it. Uh, but of course they can't, uh, they can't say that. And, and so it, it's again, uh, opportunity for, it's again an opportunity for Jesus to teach his disciples. So he gathers them together and he again has to explain to them how things work in the kingdom of God. Uh, and he uses the leadership in the world. He uses the world structure. He uses the world system to highlight the point and to contrast that with what uh, the dynamics of the kingdom, the leadership structure of, of the kingdom, how things work in that regard. You know, he says to them, listen, uh, you know, the the Gentile rulers, the Gentile leaders, you know, you know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great man exercise authority over them. You know what, guys, in the world around you, rulers rule often oppressively. They 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 wield their power because they can. 
You know, they, they wield their power not always in a manner that's good for those who are they're, they're leading. You know, it, it often benefits themselves. And we still see that today in, in, in governments around the world. Uh, you know, sometimes they act like tyrants. You know, this could be true of Rome, by the way. This would have been true of Rome and this would have been true of King Herod. But Jesus makes clear this is not the way of the kingdom. You know, the path of the kingdom is greatness comes uh, by humiliation. Greatness comes the way up is down. Uh, to use a, a popular ex expression. The position of um, those who would be great must be servants. That's what he says. Uh, whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. Uh, that's how you become great in the kingdom. And Jesus uses himself as an example. He says, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. By the way, while atonement is the not direct the direct focus of this passage, he's also making here a clear statement that his death, uh, and that he he's reaffirming that he's going to die, but also that that death, ooh, ow, would have a substitutionary impact. We we understand what a ransom is. It was a payment to free some body. It was it was a a, a payment to, designed to bring liberty. His, you know, I'm giving my life. I, I, I'm serving to the point where I'm going to die so that others could have freedom. Others could have life. Others could know the Father and the way that he seeks to be known by his uh, children. So what are we to sort of take from uh, all of this? Well, first off, our Lord and Savior, let, let's go back to the beginning. Our Lord and Savior, he marched with purpose to Jerusalem. You know, he understood what this meant and he marched ahead. He he came to do the will of the Father. And frankly, we're all sitting here now because he did so. Amen. He didn't turn around. He didn't get off that cross. He didn't call down the 10,000 angels to wipe out everyone uh, that was there now. He gave his life as a ransom for many. Um, in fact, it was a divine necessity, as one commentator put it, for him to do so because our salvation couldn't come uh, another way. And so the first point that I would want to bring home uh, for everyone sort of here is, is that even as our Savior came to do the Father's will, that's why he walked and lived on the earth. So we live to do the will of God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, that is why we're here. We aren't saved to be served. We aren't saved to conquer the earth right now and take dominion or to receive glory while we're here. We are saved to serve. Yo. Uh, we're saved not to point towards us, but to the one who uh, lives and reigns forevermore. Amen. Uh, and that's why I would say Jesus walking ahead of the disciples actually shows them the way. Look, guys, this, this is the path that you are going to have to follow. Uh, it's a, I, I need you to know up front that the path that you're walking on is going to have some troubles ahead. It's going to be some dangers ahead. It, it, it's going to be very costly for you. But nonetheless, this is the way that has to be walked. This is the will of the Father. But, but even as I'm going to die and I'm not going to stay dead, even so with you guys, you guys can know that death was not going to have uh, the final say. That, that suffering and, and, and pain, whatever you experience, uh, that's not going to be the end of the matter. Uh, in, the, in the end, uh, God is going to be glorified and, and he's going to vindicate and justify his people. Amen. Uh, Glory to God. Uh, Chuck Swindoll, he, he writes this, he says, In keeping with rabbinic custom, Jesus led his students on the trek. Mark highlights this in the phrase, walking on ahead of them. For the gospel writer, this is a reality of the disciples' life with Jesus as their teacher, but also functions as the greatest example of the life Christians are called to live. 
Jesus walked the path of suffering ahead of his disciples, who followed wherever he led them. We have to follow Christ wherever it leads. Because uh, we are saved to and for the glory of God. You know, our lives reflect this. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 10.31 makes it plain. Whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. Amen. Uh, you know, this, this is the first thing that I, I want us to see here. The, uh, the second thing is uh, on a related matter. Even as James and John were told that they were going to drink the cup and be a part of the baptism of Christ, I want to submit to all of you that all believers will do the same thing. This doesn't mean that we're all going to be severely beaten and crucified. Uh, though the latter did happen to Peter. We, we, know, we know from church history that he was crucified, or, or be it, he was crucified upside down because he didn't feel that he was worthy to be crucified in the same way as Jesus was. Wow. So they said, crucify me upside down. Um, which, you know, when you really think about it, that's something. Oh, uh, I can only, because crucifixion is painful enough. There's, there's a, your body's being torn apart, you know. You're, you're, you're not being able to breathe. But I can't imagine going through all of that and literally being upside down. Mm -hmm. I mean, because when you're upside down, you already got blood. I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if he was asking for something worse, actually. Uh, but... Um, that's actually the path that he went down. Um, it does mean that we, uh, that believers will face, can and will face persecution and even death for the sake of Christ. Um, this is happening with our brothers and sisters in Nigeria as we speak. Uh, many, many believers are being filled. And testimony of this is given later in Acts, in Acts 5 and 41. Uh... It says, so they went on their way from the presence of the council. This is after they were beaten for talking about Christ still. So they went away uh, on their way from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. And in Acts 12, 1 and 2, we actually see the ultimate sacrifice. We see, now about that time, Herod the king laid hands on some who belonged to the church in order to mistreat them. And he had James, the brother of John, so one of the sons of Zebedee, put to death with a sword. Uh, and then it goes on to talk about how he had Peter imprisoned. Uh, if we are going to follow Christ, we often will suffer like him. Now, we, we've been spared somewhat in the States for a very long time. But I, I, would, I, I dare to say that that's coming to an end if we look at the way our society is going. We will be persecuted like our Lord, which may include being physically beaten and or killed, which happens in many a nation, um, if, you know, if it not happening here. And Jesus' mentioned message to James and John was that there was a cost to following him. And all those who want to follow him are going to pay that cost. It is integral to being a disciple. You know, there's no get saved and all the your, all the problems in your life are going to go away. There's no getting saved, and it's a better roses from there. Uh, you know, you know, saying Jesus loves you and He has a wonderful plan for your life may sound nice, but it's actually not what Jesus said. Uh, and we we need to be mindful of that. Uh, we also need to be mindful, and we also need to be aware and. You know, this is more positive, that in our due time, or rather in due time, our Father will reward us for our faithfulness. Praise the Lord. He will. When and how that takes place is entirely His prerogative, though. And so we would sit and try to elevate ourselves because the way up is down, as I said before. Matthew 23 and 12. Matthew 23 and 12 says, Whoever exalts himself shall be humbled. And whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. James 4 and 6. James, the brother of Jesus, says, But he gives greater grace. Therefore it says, God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And Peter, in 1 Peter 5, 5, basically says the same thing. There is a glory waiting for us. Jesus plainly states that the Father has chosen those whom would be in positions of authority. And by, uh, 
uh, by extension, where they would be in the kingdom. You know, in, in Romans 8 and 17, we are told that if we suffer with Christ, we will be glorified together with him. And in fact, a few, many verses later in Romans 8.30... Paul speaks of it in the past tense. God has already decreed it. He's already said it in eternity past that it's going to take place. Uh, that uh, those whom he called, he also justified those. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. Uh, so it's coming. Therefore, our focus right now can and, and it should be just on lifting up the name of Jesus. Uh, the rest is already taken care of. We don't have to angle for anything or trying to do anything on our own trust in our Lord. Follow the way which he led out. Praise the Lord. The, the, the Solomon said in Proverbs, he, you know, it, he will direct our path. Glory. The Lord knows what he's doing. Amen. Praise the Lord. We have, but we just have to be willing to follow. We have to be willing to serve come what may. Serving Christ, therefore, must not be seen as a means uh, or seen or treated as a means to an end, but a privilege in and of itself. Uh, Charles Spurgeon put it this way. He writes, the genuine spirit of a Christian is not to ask that something should be done for him, but to ask his master what he could do for him. No, not Lord do this, do, do this for me, do this for me. But Lord, what, what can I do for you? How can I glorify your name? Oh, that's right. Greatness in the kingdom is service unto the Lord. And so let that be the desire of your heart. Let that be your desire in mind. That even as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom of me, uh, for many. That our desire is not to be served, it's not to be glorified, but it's to serve uh, the risen Christ. And if necessary, willing to give our life for the sake of his name and for the sake of his gospel. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you. You know, he, he said he came to give his life as a ransom for many. Um. Again, that's not something they're going to understand until after the resurrection. Uh, but he came to give his life. He came uh, because we couldn't get, we couldn't do it on our own. He came because the blood of bulls and goats can never fully and finally take away sin. Uh, he came because what we needed was not uh, keeping outside rit rituals, but having our wa our hearts washed by his blood. Uh, and we thank the Lord that that's what he accomplished uh, by the way it, I had this thought I didn't write it down but it it came to my mind again it's even as Christ Jesus had to tell his disciples three times what was going on you know this is why it, it's good for believers in Jesus Christ to hear to be reminded of the gospel the gospel isn't just for unbelievers they need to hear it but it's for believers too because we need to be reminded of where we were Amen. of what he did uh, uh, of of what kingdom life is like, we need to be reminded because we are like sheep, and sheep can go. With, matter of fact, we are his sheep. But what happens with sheep? They can veer off. Yo, Straight. yo, what what does the, the, the shepherd sometimes need to do? That with thy rod and thy staff, get, get back. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's good to be reminded that we need to, uh, we are here to serve, that we need to serve uh, the Lord and be willing to serve the Lord, wh whatever uh, it may bring. But also knowing that in the end, our labors will not be in vain. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. And that's all I have for you all this evening. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. Lord, were these, these two uh, men, James and John, were they the two of uh, two apostles? Or? Yeah, they were, these were one of the first people that were called. If we go back to Mark 1, yeah. it was Peter and Andrew, and then it was James and John. Uh, so they were there right at the beginning of, of Christ's uh, ministry. So they, they, they've been there for a while. You know, may, maybe they thought that, you know, 
you know, if there's anyone who's going to be, because uh, again, they, they had, they have to have had it in their minds that the 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 reign of the the Messiah is coming. The Messiah is here. The Messiah is supposed to set up a kingdom. So that's going to happen. Rome is going to be cast off. The wicked leaders are going to be passed off. He's going to set up his kingdom. You know, and we need to make sure that we have good spots in the kingdom. Right. Uh, whereas Christ was said, Christ's response is, well, no, you need to walk the path, and you are going to walk the path that I am, that I, that I'm walking, and you need to understand that if you want to be great, greatness comes by service. Greatness comes by uh, faithfulness uh, to, to the will, uh, to the purpose of God. Uh, that's how you'll be great. You you need to be a slave at all, and then he'll exalt you. He'll he'll lift you up. Oh, and we see this in the Old Testament. We can look at the Old, the Old Testament. Uh, you know, Joseph had dreams, but Joseph never actually tried to angle for himself power. Uh, rather, he was sold into slavery, and then the Lord blessed him and made him over part of his house. Then he got thrown in prison, and the Lord blessed him. Uh, and he was put over all of Egypt. Uh, David didn't go looking for Samuel. Samuel saw all the other sons of Jesse and they were handsome and they're strong and this and that. And, uh, the Lord's like to Samuel, listen, buddy, you all look at the outward appearance, but I judge the heart. Um, and Samuel had to say to Jesse, is there one more child? And, uh, he said, to, yeah, there's the one out tending the sheep, bring him. And he brings David and the Lord says, that's the one. Um. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's uh, the way up is by faithful service to the Lord. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. But you would you would think that John would have been content with Jesus, but what Jesus has done for him, or because he was his favorite apostle. Ah, uh, the John, the beloved disciple. Yes. Yeah. And then he and then he put his mother Mary in charge of of him. Well, he put he put Mary in the care of uh, right. uh, uh, of John. Yeah. Of John, right. um, well, you know, not to be too hard on on, on on the disciples. You know, they, you know, they're still operating in the world. They still have a mindset. They still have an expect expectation. You know that that's still governing it. Governing it. This is why later on, you know, you go, scriptures talk about the renewing of your mind. They they hadn't had yet their mind renewed. Yeah. And frankly, it wasn't until after, really after Christ rose again from the, rose again from the dead, uh, that things started to change. Luke twenty four talks about he how he opened up their mind to understand the scriptures. You know they had to have their mind open. You know the some of the things Christ says, John Christ talks about in John. Some things look I can't tell you now. Some things are gonna have to wait for the coming of the Spirit, who's going to, you know, teach you, uh, and and you know, bring to remembrance all that I've said. And then then at that point they begin to understand things. Um, so yeah, you, 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 we, we can say looking back, yeah, they should have realized this and, you know, you know, that, that's true. Uh, but you know, they were very much sort of operating according to the standards of their time. And again, that's why we, we can't do that. We can look at just an example. This is what we can't do. We need to have our, our mind renewed. We need to be washed by the word and we need to be faithful. So. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so if all hearts and minds are clear, yes. we can close out and uh, close in prayer and we will sing. Father, we thank you, O oh God. Father, we thank you for your word. Father, we thank you for reminding us, O oh God, of the importance of humble service unto thee. For reminding us, O oh God, that the, the economy of the kingdom, O oh God, is uh, means that greatness, O oh God, comes, O oh God, to, to those who willingly serve you, O oh God, who, who set their minds only on your glory and not their own, O oh God. Uh, that those who humble themselves before you, O oh God, can be exalted. Father, write these words afresh and anew upon our hearts, O oh God, and also, O oh God, to... That we remember, oh God, that it's we must always operate it according to kingdom dynamics, oh God, and never the ways of this world. Father, we thank you again, oh God, for our time here, oh God. We thank you again for the this household hosting us, oh God. We pray your blessing, oh God. We rest, rule, and abide in this place. Uh, as we sing your praise, oh God, we pray, oh God, that you would find our, uh, our sing, oh God, our worship, oh God, uh, that you would find the fruit of our lips pleasing, praising, and truly acceptable in your sight. Father, when we would leave this place, let us not go 
uh, from your presence, but with our hearts and our minds stayed upon thee, trusted in thee, and give us safe travel and mercies, O oh God, that we may return to our homes, O oh God, and gather together at the next appointed time. Father, we thank you. We ask these mighty blessings. In the matchless and mighty name of Jesus, we pray.